District of Columbia v. Heller, 554 U.S. 570, 2008, is a landmark case in which the Supreme Court of the United States held, in a 5-4 decision, that the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to possess a firearm unconnected with service in a militia for traditionally lawful purposes, such as self-defense within the home, and that Washington, D.C.S. handgun ban and requirement that lawfully owned rifles and shotguns be kept unloaded and disassembled or bound by a trigger lock. Violated this guarantee. Due to Washington, D.C.S. special status as a federal district, the decision did not address the question of whether the Second Amendment's protections are incorporated by the Due Process Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment against the states, which was addressed two years later by McDonald v. City of Chicago, 2010, in which it was found that they are. It was the first Supreme Court case to decide whether the Second Amendment protects an individual right to keep and bear arms for self-defense. On June 26, 2008, the Supreme Court affirmed the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit in Heller v. District of Columbia. The Supreme Court struck down provisions of the Firearms Control Regulations Act of 1975 as unconstitutional, determined that handguns are arms for the purposes of the Second Amendment, found that the Regulations Act was an unconstitutional ban, and struck down the portion of the Regulations Act that requires all firearms including rifles and shotguns be kept unloaded and disassembled or bound by a trigger lock. Prior to this decision the Firearms Control Regulation Act of 1975 also restricted residents from owning handguns except for those registered prior to 1975. The majority opinion, written by Justice Antonin Scalia, and the primary dissenting opinion, written by Justice John Paul Stevens, are considered examples of the application of originalism in practice. Lower Court Background In 2002, Robert A. Levy, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, began vetting plaintiffs with Clark M. Neely III, for a planned Second Amendment lawsuit that he would personally finance. Although he himself had never owned a gun, as a constitutional scholar he had an academic interest in the subject and wanted to model his campaign after the legal strategies of Thurgood Marshall, who had successfully led the challenges that overturned school segregation. They aimed for a group that would be diverse in terms of gender, race, economic background, and age, and selected six plaintiffs from their mid-20s to early 60s, three men and three women, four white and two black. Shelley Parker A software designer and former nurse who had been active in trying to rid her neighborhood of drugs. Parker is a single woman whose life had been threatened on numerous occasions by drug dealers who had sometimes tried to break into her house. Tom G. Palmer A colleague of Robert A. Levy at the Cato Institute and the only plaintiff that Levy knew before the case began. Palmer, who is gay, defended himself with a 9mm handgun in 1982. While walking with a friend in San Jose, California, he was accosted by a gang of about 20 young men who used profane language regarding his sexual orientation and threatened his life. When he produced his gun, the men fled. Palmer believes that the handgun saved his life. Gillian St. Lawrence a mortgage broker who lives in the Georgetown section of D.C. and who owns several legally registered long guns which she uses for recreation in nearby Chantilly, Virginia. It had taken St. Lawrence two years to complete the registration process. She wanted to be able to use these guns to defend herself in her home and to be able to register a handgun. Tracy Embo, now Tracy Hansen. An employee of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Originally from St. Gabriel, Louisiana, she lives in the Adams Morgan neighborhood of D.C. with her husband, Andrew Hansen, who is from Waterloo, Iowa. They live in a high-crime neighborhood near Union Station in D.C. She grew up around guns and wanted one to defend her home. George Leon A communications lawyer who had previously contacted the National Rifle Association about filing a lawsuit to challenge the D.C. gun laws. Leon held D.C. licenses for a shotgun and a rifle, but wanted to have a handgun in his home. Dick Anthony Heller A licensed special police officer for the District of Columbia. For his job, Heller carried a gun in federal office buildings, 
but was not allowed to have one in his home. Heller had lived in southeast D.C. near the Kentucky Court's public housing complex since 1970 and had seen the neighborhood transformed from a child-friendly welfare complex to a drug haven. Heller had also approached the National Rifle Association about a lawsuit to overturn the D.C. gun ban, but the NRA declined. Previous federal case law pertaining to the question of an individual's right to bear arms included United States v. Emerson, 270 F.3 D. 203, 5th Sir 2001, which supported the right and Silvera v. Lockyer, 312 F.3 D. 1052, 9th Sir 2002, which opposed the right. The Supreme Court ruling in United States v. Miller, 307 U.S. 174, 1939, was interpreted to support both sides of the issue. District Court In February 2003, the six residents of Washington, D.C. filed a lawsuit in the District Court for the District of Columbia, challenging the constitutionality of provisions of the Firearms Control Regulations Act of 1975, a local law, part of the District of Columbia Code, enacted pursuant to District of Columbia Home Rule. This law restricted residents from owning handguns, excluding those grandfathered in by registration prior to 1975 and those possessed by active and retired law enforcement officers. The law also required that all firearms including rifles and shotguns be kept unloaded and disassembled or bound by a trigger lock. They filed for an injunction pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 2201, 2202, and 42 U.S.C. 1983. District Court Judge Ricardo M. Urbina dismissed the lawsuit. Court of Appeals On appeal, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit reversed the dismissal in a two-to-one decision. The Court of Appeals struck down provisions of the Firearms Control Regulations Act as unconstitutional. Judges Karen L. Henderson, Thomas B. Griffith and Lawrence H. Silberman formed the Court of Appeals panel, with Senior Circuit Judge Silberman writing the Court's opinion and Circuit Judge Henderson dissenting. The Court's opinion first addressed whether appellants have standing to sue for declaratory and injunctive relief in Section 2, Slip OP at 5-12. The Court concluded that of the six plaintiffs, only Heller, who applied for a handgun permit but was denied, had standing. The Court then held that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to keep and bear arms, that the right existed prior to the formation of the new government under the Constitution, also stating that the right was premised on the private use of arms for activities such as hunting and self-defense, the latter being understood as resistance to either private lawlessness or the depredations of a tyrannical government, or a threat from abroad. They also noted that though the right to bear arms also help preserve the citizen militia, the activities protects are not limited to militia service, nor is an individual's enjoyment of the right contingent upon his or her continued or intermittent enrollment in the militia. The court determined that handguns are arms and concluded that thus they may not be banned by the District of Columbia. The court also struck down the portion of the law that requires all firearms including rifles and shotguns be kept unloaded and disassembled or bound by a trigger lock. The district argued that there is an implicit self-defense exception to these provisions, but the D.C. Circuit rejected this view, saying that the requirement amounted to a complete ban on functional firearms and prohibition on use for self-defense. Section 7 to 2507.02, like the bar on carrying a pistol within the home, amounts to a complete prohibition on the lawful use of handguns for self-defense. As such, we hold it unconstitutional. Henderson's dissent. In her dissent, Circuit Judge Henderson stated that Second Amendment rights did not extend to residents of Washington, D.C., writing. To sum up, there is no dispute that the Constitution, case law, and applicable statutes all establish that the district is not a state within the meaning of the Second Amendment. Under United States v. Miller, 307 U.S. at 178, the Second Amendment's declaration and guarantee that the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed relates to the militia of the states only. That the Second Amendment does not apply to the district, then, is, to me, an unavoidable conclusion.
petition for rehearing. In April 2007, the district and mayor Adrian Fenty petitioned for rehearing and bank, arguing that the ruling created inter- and intra-jurisdictional conflict. On May 8, the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit denied the request to rehear the case, by a 6-4 vote. Supreme Court The defendants petitioned the United States Supreme Court to hear the case. The plaintiffs did not oppose but, in fact, welcomed the petition. The Supreme Court granted certiorari on November 20, 2007. The court rephrased the question to be decided as follows. The petition for a writ of certiorari is granted limited to the following question, whether the following provisions, DC Code 7-2502.02, A, 4, 22, 4504, A, and 7-2507.02, to violate the Second Amendment rights of individuals who are not affiliated with any state-regulated militia, but who wish to keep handguns and other firearms for private use in their homes. This represented the first time since the 1939 case United States v. Miller that the Supreme Court had directly addressed the scope of the Second Amendment. Amicus Curiae Briefs Because of the controversial nature of the case, it garnered much attention from many groups on both sides of the gun rights issue. Many of those groups filed Amicus Curiae, Friend of the Court, Briefs, about 47, urging the court to affirm the case and about 20 to remand it. A majority of the members of Congress signed the brief authored by Stephen Halbrook advising that the case be affirmed overturning the ban on handguns not otherwise restricted by Congress. Vice President Dick Cheney joined in this brief, acting in his role as President of the United States Senate, and breaking with the George W. Bush administration's official position. Arizona Senator John McCain, Republican, also signed the brief. Then Illinois Senator Barack Obama, did not. A majority of the states signed the brief of Texas Attorney General Greg Abbott, authored by Abbott's Solicitor General, Ted Cruz, advising that the case be affirmed, while at the same time emphasizing that the states have a strong interest in maintaining each of the state's laws prohibiting and regulating firearms. Law enforcement organizations, including the Fraternal Order of Police and the Southern States Police Benevolent Association, also filed a brief urging that the case be affirmed. A number of organizations signed friend of the court briefs advising that the case be remanded, including the United States Department of Justice and Attorneys General of New York, Hawaii, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Puerto Rico. Additionally, friend of the court briefs to remand were filed by a spectrum of religious and anti-violence groups, a number of cities and mayors, and many police chiefs and law enforcement organizations. A collection of organizations and prominent scholars, represented by attorney Jeffrey Teichert, submitted an errors brief arguing that many of the common historical and factual myths and misrepresentations generally offered in favor of banning handguns were in error. Teichert's errors brief argued from a historical perspective that the Second Amendment protected an individual right to keep and bear arms. Oral Arguments the Supreme Court heard oral arguments in the case on March 18, 2008. Both the transcript and the audio of the argument have been released. Each side was initially allotted 30 minutes to argue its case, with U.S. Solicitor General Paul D. Clement allotted 15 minutes to present the federal government's views. During the argument, however, extra time was extended to the parties, and the argument ran 23 minutes over the allotted time. Walter E. Dellinger of the law firm O'Melveny and Myers, also a professor at Duke University Law School and former acting Solicitor General, argued the district's side before the Supreme Court. Dellinger was assisted by Thomas Goldstein of Aiken Gump Strauss Hauer and Feld, Robert Long of Covington and Burling and D.C. Solicitor General Todd Kim. The law firms assisting the district worked pro bono. Alan Gura, of the D.C-based law firm Gura and Pazeska, was lead counsel for Heller, and argued on his behalf before the Supreme Court. Robert Levy, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, and Clark Neely, a senior attorney at the Institute for Justice, were his co-counsel. Decision The Supreme Court held 1. 
the Second Amendment protects an individual right to possess a firearm unconnected with service in a militia, and to use that arm for traditionally lawful purposes, such as self-defense within the home. pp 2-53. a. The amendment's prefatory clause announces a purpose, but does not limit or expand the scope of the second part, the operative clause. The operative clause's text and history demonstrate that it connotes an individual right to keep and bear arms. pp 2-22. b. The prefatory clause comports with the court's interpretation of the operative clause. The militia comprised all males physically capable of acting in concert for the common defense. The anti-federalists feared that the federal government would disarm the people in order to disable the citizens' militia, enabling a politicized standing army or a select militia to rule. The response was to deny Congress power to abridge the ancient right of individuals to keep and bear arms, so that the ideal of a citizen's militia would be preserved. pp 22-28. c. The court's interpretation is confirmed by analogous arms-bearing rights in state constitutions that preceded and immediately followed the Second Amendment. pp 28-30. d. The Second Amendment's drafting history, while of dubious interpretive worth, reveals three state Second Amendment proposals that unequivocally referred to an individual right to bear arms. pp 30-32. e. Interpretation of the Second Amendment by scholars, courts and legislators, from immediately after its ratification through the late 19th century also supports the court's conclusion. pp 32-47. f. None of the court's precedents forecloses the court's interpretation. Neither United States v. Cruikshank, 92 U.S. 542, nor Presser v. Illinois, 116 U.S. 252, refutes the individual rights interpretation. United States v. Miller, 307 U.S. 174, does not limit the right to keep and bear arms to militia purposes, but rather limits the type of weapon to which the right applies to those used by the militia, i.e., those in common use for lawful purposes. 2. Like most rights, the Second Amendment right is not unlimited. It is not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever in any manner whatsoever and for whatever purpose, for example, concealed weapons prohibitions have been upheld under the amendment or state analogs. The court's opinion should not be taken to cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places such as schools and government buildings, or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. Miller's holding that the sorts of weapons protected are those in common use at the time finds support in the historical tradition of prohibiting the carrying of dangerous and unusual weapons. pp 54-56. 3. The handgun ban and the trigger lock requirement, as applied to self-defense, violate the Second Amendment. The district's total ban on handgun possession in the home amounts to a prohibition on an entire class of arms that Americans overwhelmingly choose for the lawful purpose of self-defense. Under any of the standards of scrutiny the court has applied to enumerated constitutional rights, this prohibition, in the place where the importance of the lawful defense of self, family, and property is most acute, would fail constitutional muster. Similarly, the requirement that any lawful firearm in the home be disassembled or bound by a trigger lock makes it impossible for citizens to use arms for the core lawful purpose of self-defense and is hence unconstitutional. Because Heller conceded at oral argument that the D.C. licensing law is permissible if it is not enforced arbitrarily and capriciously, the court assumes that a license will satisfy his prayer for relief and does not address the licensing requirement. Assuming he is not disqualified from exercising Second Amendment rights, the district must permit Heller to register his handgun and must issue him a license to carry it in the home. pp 56-64 The opinion of the court, delivered by Justice Scalia, was joined by Chief Justice John G. Roberts, Jr. and by Justices Anthony M. Kennedy, Clarence Thomas and Samuel A. Alito, Jr. Second Amendment Findings and Reasoning for the Decision the Illinois Supreme Court in People v. Aguilar, 2013, summed up the Heller's findings and reasoning.
in District of Columbia v. Heller, 554 U.S. 570, 2008, the Supreme Court undertook its first ever in-depth examination of the Second Amendment's meaning ID at 635. After a lengthy historical discussion, the Court ultimately concluded that the Second Amendment guarantee the individual right to possess and carry weapons in case of confrontation, ID at 592, that central to this right is the inherent right of self-defense, ID at 628, that the home is where the need for defense of self, family, and property is most acute, ID at 628, and that, above all other interests, the Second Amendment elevates the right of law-abiding, responsible citizens to use arms in defense of hearth and home, ID at 635. Based on this understanding, the court held that a District of Columbia law banning handgun possession in the home violated the Second Amendment. ID at 635. Issues addressed by the majority. The core holding in D.C. v. Heller is that the Second Amendment is an individual right intimately tied to the natural right of self-defense. The Scalia majority invokes much historical material to support its finding that the right to keep and bear arms belongs to individuals, more precisely, Scalia asserts in the court's opinion that the people to whom the Second Amendment right is accorded are the same people who enjoy First and Fourth Amendment protection, the Constitution was written to be understood by the voters, its words and phrases were used in their normal and ordinary as distinguished from technical meaning. United States v. Sprague, 282 U.S. 716, 731, 1931, see also Gibbons v. Ogden, 9 wheat. 1, 188, 1824. Normal meaning may of course include an idiomatic meaning, but it excludes secret or technical meanings. With that finding as anchor, the court ruled a total ban on operative handguns in the home is unconstitutional, as the ban runs afoul of both the self-defense purpose of the Second Amendment, a purpose not previously articulated by the court, and the in common use at the time prong of the Miller decision, since handguns are in common use, their ownership is protected. The court applies as remedy that assuming that Heller is not disqualified from the exercise of Second Amendment rights, the district must permit him to register his handgun and must issue him a license to carry it in the home. The court, additionally, hinted that other remedy might be available in the form of eliminating the license requirement for carry in the home, but that no such relief had been requested, respondent conceded at oral argument that he does not have a problem with licensing and that the district's law is permissible so long as it is not enforced in an arbitrary and capricious manner. TR of Oral ARG 74-75 We therefore assume that petitioner's issuance of a license will satisfy respondent's prayer for relief and do not address the licensing requirement. In regard to the scope of the right, the court wrote, in an obiter dictum, although we do not undertake an exhaustive historical analysis today of the full scope of the Second Amendment, nothing in our opinion should be taken to cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill, or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places such as schools and government buildings, or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. The court also added dicta regarding the private ownership of machine guns. In doing so, it suggested the elevation of the in common use at the time prong of the Miller decision, which by itself protects handguns, over the first prong, protecting arms that have some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia, which may not by itself protect machine guns, it may be objected that if weapons that are most useful in military service, M16 rifles and the like, may be banned, then the Second Amendment right is completely detached from the prefatory clause. But as we have said, the conception of the militia at the time of the Second Amendment's ratification was the body of all citizens capable of military service, who would bring the sorts of lawful weapons that they possessed at home. The court did not address which level of judicial review should be used by lower courts in deciding future cases claiming infringement of the right to keep and bear arms, since this case represents this court's first in-depth examination of the Second Amendment,
one should not expect it to clarify the entire field. The court states, if all that was required to overcome the right to keep and bear arms was a rational basis, the Second Amendment would be redundant with the separate constitutional prohibitions on irrational laws, and would have no effect. Also, regarding Justice Breyer's proposal of a judge empowering interest balancing inquiry, the court states, we know of no other enumerated constitutional right whose core protection has been subjected to a freestanding interest balancing approach. Dissenting Opinions In a dissenting opinion, Justice John Paul Stevens stated that the court's judgment was a strained and unpersuasive reading which overturned long-standing precedent, and that the court had bestowed a dramatic upheaval in the law. Stevens also stated that the amendment was notable for the omission of any statement of purpose related to the right to use firearms for hunting or personal self-defense which was present in the declarations of rights of Pennsylvania and Vermont. The Stevens dissent seems to rest on four main points of disagreement, that the founders would have made the individual right aspect of the Second Amendment express if that was what was intended, that the militia preamble and exact phrase to keep and bear arms demands the conclusion that the Second Amendment touches on state militia service only, that many lower courts later collective right reading of the Miller decision constitutes stare decisis, which may only be overturned at great peril, and that the court has not considered gun control laws, e.g., the National Firearms Act, unconstitutional. The dissent concludes, the court would have us believe that over 200 years ago, the framers made a choice to limit the tools available to elected officials wishing to regulate civilian uses of weapons. I could not possibly conclude that the framers made such a choice. Justice Stevens' dissent was joined by Justices David Souter, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and Stephen Breyer. Justice Breyer filed a separate dissenting opinion, joined by the same dissenting justices, which sought to demonstrate that, starting from the premise of an individual rights view, the District of Columbia's handgun ban and trigger lock requirement would nevertheless be permissible limitations on the right. The Breyer dissent looks to early municipal fire safety laws that forbade the storage of gunpowder, and in Boston the carrying of loaded arms into certain buildings, and on nuisance laws providing fines or loss of firearm for imprudent usage, as demonstrating the Second Amendment has been understood to have no impact on the regulation of civilian firearms. The dissent argues the public safety necessity of gun control laws, quoting that guns were responsible for 69 deaths in this country each day. With these two supports, the Breyer dissent goes on to conclude, there simply is no untouchable constitutional right guaranteed by the Second Amendment to keep loaded handguns in the house in crime-ridden urban areas. It proposes that firearms laws be reviewed by balancing the interests, i.e., interest balancing approach, of Second Amendment protections against the government's compelling interest of preventing crime. The Breyer dissent also objected to the common use distinction used by the majority to distinguish handguns from machine guns, but what sense does this approach make? According to the majority's reasoning, if Congress and the states lift restrictions on the possession and use of machine guns, and people buy machine guns to protect their homes, the court will have to reverse course and find that the Second Amendment does, in fact, protect the individual self-defense-related right to possess a machine gun, there is no basis for believing that the framers intended such circular reasoning. Non-party involvement National Rifle Association Attorney Alan Gura, in a 2003 filing, used the term sham litigation to describe the NRA's attempts to have Parker, a.k.a. Heller, consolidated with its own case challenging the D.C. law. Gura also stated that the NRA was adamant about not wanting the Supreme Court to hear the case. These concerns were based on NRA lawyers' assessment that the justices at the time the case was filed might reach an unfavorable decision. Cato Institute senior fellow Robert Levy, co-counsel to the Parker plaintiffs, has stated that the Parker plaintiffs faced repeated attempts by the NRA to derail the litigation. He also stated that the N.RAS interference in this process set us back and almost killed the case. It was a very acrimonious relationship. Wayne LaPierre, the NRA's chief executive officer, confirmed the NRA's misgivings.
there was a real dispute on our side among the constitutional scholars about whether there was a majority of justices on the Supreme Court who would support the Constitution as written, Mr. Lapierre said. Both Levy and Lapierre said the NRA and Mr. Levy's team were now on good terms. Elaine McArdle wrote in the Harvard Law Bulletin, if Parker is the long-awaited clean case, one reason may be that proponents of the individual rights view of the Second Amendment, including the National Rifle Association, which filed an amicus brief in the case, have learned from earlier defeats, and crafted strategies to maximize the chances of Supreme Court review. The NRA did eventually support the litigation by filing an amicus brief with the court arguing that the plaintiffs in Parker had standing to sue and that the D.C. ban was unconstitutional under the Second Amendment. Chris Cox, executive director of the NRA's Institute for Legislative Action, had indicated support of federal legislation which would repeal the D.C. gun ban. Opponents of the legislation argued that this would have rendered the Parker case moot, and would have effectively eliminated the possibility that the case would be heard by the Supreme Court. Immediately after the Supreme Court's ruling, the NRA filed a lawsuit against the city of Chicago over its handgun ban, followed the next day by a lawsuit against the city of San Francisco over its ban of handguns in public housing. Brady Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence The Brady Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence opposed the arguments made by the plaintiffs in Parker, and filed amicus curiae against those arguments in both the district and circuit courts. Paul Helmke, the president of the Brady Campaign, suggested to D.C. before the court granted certiorari that it modify its gun laws rather than appeal to the Supreme Court. Helmke has written that if the Supreme Court upholds the circuit court ruling, it could lead to all current and proposed firearms laws being called into question. After the ruling, Paul Helmke stated that, the classic slippery slope argument, that even modest gun control would lead down the path to a complete ban on gun ownership, is now gone. Helmke added that, the court also rejected the absolutist misreading of the Second Amendment that some used to argue any gun, any time for anyone, which many politicians have used as an excuse to do nothing about the scourge of gun violence in our country and to block passage of common-sense gun laws. Reactions To the lower court rulings Various experts expressed opinions on the D.C. Circuit's decision. Harvard Law School professor Lawrence Tribe contended that the Second Amendment protects an individual right, and predicted that if Parker is reviewed by the Supreme Court there. Please subscribe and thanks for watching.